We are now going to make the switch from talking about energy and move on to talking about matter, which we will find also requires us to talk about energy, because the two of them are intertwined in many ways within ecosystems. We know that energy is stored in carbon compounds, and carbon compounds are made out of matter, which is the actual material components of living and non-living things in an ecosystem. We call the matter that makes up living organisms biomass. Bio meaning living, and mass relating to the components that make up the structures. When organisms like autotrophs create their own food, as seen via the process of photosynthesis, they are making and gaining biomass with the sugar produced from the process. We refer to the production of biomass through autotrophs as primary production, as they are creating organic compounds from inorganic materials that end up supporting the entire ecosystem. The total amount of biomass that autotrophs produce within an ecosystem is called gross primary production, abbreviated GPP. But remember from the part 1 video that these autotrophs use the carbon compounds they create for the process of cell respiration, which is a process that uses biomass and the energy stored within it. This used up biomass and associated energy can no longer be consumed by a heterotroph, which means it cannot be moved up the food chain. We account for this loss of biomass in a measurement of net primary production, in which we take the gross primary production of biomass and subtract the loss from cell respiration. The unit of measurement for biomass are grams of carbon per meter squared per year. Autotrophs tend to have different primary production levels based on the biome they are in. Some biomes like deserts have low primary production rates because the required resources for photosynthesis to take place are minimal. Other biomes like a tropical rainforest have abundant resources to support photosynthesis, so plants can produce a large amount of biomass per year in that area. Autotrophs are the only organisms that can contribute to the primary production of biomass. Though both autotrophs and heterotrophs can support the accumulation of biomass in an ecosystem by growing, which increases the biomass of each individual organism, and by reproduction, which creates more organisms that store their own biomass. When calculating the biomass of an entire ecosystem, all of these living components, both autotrophs and heterotrophs, are counted. Taking a deeper look at heterotrophs, the accumulation of biomass in heterotrophs is called secondary production. Heterotrophs acquire their accumulated biomass by consuming other organisms, which could be autotrophs or heterotrophs. But because secondary production always involves consuming other organisms, which has to start with a primary consumer, and not the creation of biomass that would happen with a primary producer, the results of secondary production will always be lower than that of primary production. Each trophic level will be able to accumulate less biomass due to energy restraints that we know is used up through cell respiration, which itself results in the loss of carbon compounds that are broken down and consumed in the process. So remember that secondary production will always be lower than primary production. And as we learned on the last slide, net primary production is always lower than gross gross primary production. When looking at matter in ecosystems, we need to understand that matter moves around in constant cycles, allowing it to be reused over and over. This makes sense, that we reuse all of the materials found within an ecosystem, because other than a few random meteorites, our planet does not get any new matter. We have to use and reuse what we already have. This is the opposite of energy, which is constantly entering our planet via sunlight. Scientists create diagrams to show how matter cycles around ecosystems. And go figure, when we are talking about carbon, we call this diagram a carbon cycle. We can take a look at this example to show how carbon can move, and the idea is that no matter where we start, we should be able to move around and get back to the beginning, hence the cycle. Any location that carbon is stored in, no matter the state, is called a pool. So the atmosphere, biosphere, hydrosphere, etc., those are all considered different pools because they all hold carbon in one form or another. Let's talk through an example of carbon moving between two different pools that you need to know for the IB exam. Carbon exists in the atmosphere as gaseous carbon dioxide. It can be taken in by plants via the process of photosynthesis in which it is converted into glucose or other carbon compounds. Animals in the area can feed upon the plants, stealing those carbon compounds and storing them in their own tissues. The carbon compounds can then be used for cell respiration, which breaks them down and produces carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is a waste product for consumers, so they get rid of it through respiration, which puts it back into the atmosphere, thus completing the cycle. Be sure to understand how to interpret and also create carbon cycle diagrams of your own for the exam. 
When we look at carbon moving in ecosystems, it is usually a balancing act with the scales constantly changing based on the current environmental conditions. This means that carbon does not always move at the same rate to and from every pool. Let's use the same example from the last slide to talk about these new points. Let's say that the collective amount of photosynthesis of all autotrophs in an ecosystem is greater than the total amount of cell respiration occurring in all organisms. If this is the case, over time, more carbon will be removed from the atmosphere than enters it. This means that the autotrophs will decrease the overall amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide because it will be stored within their tissues. We call this increase in carbon storage in a particular pool a carbon sink. It is storing more carbon than it usually does temporarily removing it from the cycle. On the other hand, if carbon dioxide from cell respiration was greater than the total amount taken in by photosynthesis, this would lead to an increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide. This would result in the organisms that are undergoing the cell respiration to be called a carbon source. Because once carbon is in the atmosphere, it is readily available to enter multiple other pools in the carbon cycle. Based on the situation and the environment at that given time, different pools and groups can be treated as either sinks or sources. It is your job to interpret that with the information provided. As we discussed earlier, carbon sinks have the ability to store large amounts of carbon. Four carbon sinks that you need to be familiar with are oil and natural gas, coal, peat, and biomass. These all are or were formed at different times on Earth, meaning they have held onto and sequestered carbon for different durations. Natural gas and oil found in Earth's crust were formed over the past 550 million years by decomposed organic matter that was buried under sediments. High temperatures prompted chemical changes to create the oil and natural gas trapped within porous rocks. Coal was mostly formed around 300 million years ago by accumulated wood and plant material that was buried under sediments. Heat and pressure over time compacted the carbon molecules from these organisms and created coal. Peat is a material formed over the past 10,000 years due to the partial decomposition of organisms in acidic and waterlogged environments. And biomass in trees has accumulated over the past few thousand years driven by photosynthesis that takes in carbon to create sugars and other molecules. These four materials, all of which store carbon, can undergo a chemical reaction called combustion, in which they are burned in the presence of oxygen, producing energy and releasing carbon dioxide into the air. Since the discovery of fire a few million years ago by our hominid ancestors, we have been burning carbon sinks, like wood from trees, for energy, cooking, and many other things. But as we stated before, burning materials puts more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which changes the chemistry of the atmosphere. And because some of these materials have held onto carbon for millions of years, we are disrupting the natural carbon cycle when we extract and burn them for power. It's a bit of a double-edged sword because we need power to innovate as a society, but continuing to get power from this method will have negative effects on our planet, and therefore on us as well which we have already started to see. Humans have been keeping significant track of atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations since 1959 by an observatory in Hawaii, started by a scientist named Charles Keeling. Data continues to be collected and is plotted into a graph which is known as the Keeling curve. Taking a look at the data, we can identify two important trends. The first trend is that the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide fluctuates on a yearly basis, which is why we can see the sharp ups and downs every year in the data. This is due to imbalances of photosynthesis and cell respiration that change every year due to seasons. There is less carbon dioxide in the air when the northern hemisphere is warm and plants are undergoing higher rates of photosynthesis. Winter in the northern hemisphere has the opposite effect, which results in increased rates of carbon dioxide staying in the atmosphere. The second trend we see in the data is that over the years, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has gone up. This is likely due to the irregular burning of fossil fuels by humans, which include the burning of coal, oil, and natural gas, along with high rates of deforestation that humans also do, which eliminates trees and plants that would otherwise remove the carbon dioxide from the air via photosynthesis. To sum this up, when we look at these trends, we can say that the yearly fluctuations are due to natural seasons, and the overall increase year after year is due to human activity, including the combustion of fossil fuels and deforestation.
We have talked about how carbon cycles in ecosystems, but carbon is, of course, not the only component that cycles. Oxygen, nitrogen, and many other elements have their own unique cycles that get moved around in different pools and sinks. Looking closer at oxygen and carbon, there is an important relationship that they share with how they cycle between photosynthesis and cell respiration. The process of photosynthesis needs carbon dioxide as a reactant and produces oxygen as a product, where cell respiration needs oxygen as a reactant and generates carbon dioxide as a product. These two processes support each other, with the atmosphere being a middleman at some point for both oxygen and carbon. Not to mention the carbon found within glucose that also plays a very important role in connecting these processes. It is for this reason that we could not survive without plants, as they provide the oxygen to the atmosphere that we breathe in. Continuing the idea on the last slide, we know chemicals other than carbon cycle within ecosystems on our planet. The reality is that living organisms need to accumulate many chemicals in order to live, as we can see on the periodic table here just how many of these chemicals are important to us. Because the Earth has only a finite amount of these chemicals, they all need to be cycled from living organisms to the environment and back to be used again. Decomposers play a large role in this process, as they provide a pathway for many of these chemicals to be reused by breaking them down into forms that can be taken in by autotrophs and other organisms, allowing them to re-enter the cycle. You do not need to know any other specific cycles for the exam other than the carbon cycle, but know that all other chemicals do cycle in a similar manner.